Praise the Lord. Welcome, everyone, to the afternoon service here at Lighthouse Ranch Church. God bless you that are online. And a special thanks to Pam, who sent some food over for after the service. God bless you, Pam, for your faithfulness and your love for us and for the Lord. Praise God. You know, there was some question here the last few days, or some d discussion, I might say, maybe not a question, but some discussion amongst some about the Holy Spirit. And so the Lord has given me a message here called the Comforter. The Comforter is the Holy Spirit, of course. So we're going to go through a few scriptures here that'll, that'll help us to understand a little more fully about this marvelous, wonderful entity, you might say, that we have as the indwelling Christ through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells us and we experience Christ. It's, it's just a mystery, a tremendous miracle of the living God. So we go first to John 14, 16. It says, I will pray the Father, Jesus is speaking, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And it's important that we include the verse just prior to that one because it is part of that particular context. So verse 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. That particular verse there is the first New Testament mention of the word comforter. And so I ran that word, and it is... Um, uh, called Paracletus in the Greek and Nakam in the Hebrew, and it was it was it was enlightening to know that the the Lord through His Word all the way through that He proves His Word from the beginning to the end. So the first mention of it was in Genesis 5.29. They're speaking of Noah. And he called his name Comforter, first Old Testament mention. He called his name Comforter, and this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. So therefore, the, the Lord, it's a shadow and a type, or it's a pointing to uh, the, the Christ. Noah was a type of Christ in that he was there in a, in a situation as a deliverer. And he preached for over a hundred years to the people and bless his heart, didn't get one convert except his family. And when the Lord brought the flood and destroyed everyone but Noah and his family. But anyway, this is the first mention of the comfort that his name, his name is Noah. It shall be a comfort unto us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Isn't it marvelous to know that even in the midst of this world that is in terrible turmoil at this very moment and in chaotic uh, circumstances all over the world, still we can have comfort and joy in the Holy Ghost that the world cannot have. That's the only mention I'm bringing into the into the old from the Old Testament. I want to speak to you mostly about what the New Testament says about 
the Comforter. And you know, as I began to run down the verses that that we're going to be bringing up and, and, and looking into, I began to realize this is a subject that you'd probably need a week-long conference to even try to begin to cover all of the verses that pertain to the Spirit of God. Uh, when you go to 14, John, excuse me, go to John 14, 26, it names, it says, but the Comforter is, and then defines it as the Holy Ghost. So there's the definite proof that the Comforter Scriptural proof that the Comforter is the Holy Ghost. And it goes further, that to whom the Father will send in my name, as Jesus is speaking, the Father will send the Comforter, the Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus, and the work he shall do, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So that each one of us can know that God wants us to understand him and his word and the Holy Spirit that God gives those who reach out for Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, the indwelling uh, spirit of the living God will teach us as we hunger and thirst for his word and that we can understand and know him. It's also important to know that Jesus made these statements and to remind you that he says, I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter. There again, solidifying and, and absolutely crystal clear teaches us that even though the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three persons, they are one, one God. Each one different, yet they are, they, are, they are never divided. They are one. It is, it is a mystery that, that is difficult to explain, but can be understood in the spirit. Because we understand those who have received Christ. Spiritual things compared with spiritual things. Why? Because the Holy Spirit teaches us. Because the Holy Spirit enlightens us. It becomes obvious to us, to the world. The world cannot understand it. Because the spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The world is not spiritually minded. The world cannot understand this. When Jesus said, I will pray the Father, that he shall give you another comforter. That's the trini trinity there. I, Jesus, will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever. It's important to know that as the Holy Spirit abides with you, that he is God, the same as the Father and the Son. And that you have one, you have all. So that he may abide with you, mean God abides with you. Praise the Lord. So I hope that that blesses you and helps you in understanding a little further about the Holy Spirit. Now, re now, remember, I told you there are many passages that talk about the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. But what I'm going to bring you today, just those in the New Testament, actually, that you may not have run across where it gives the uh, another name to the Comforter. We find that first mentioned in John 15, 26. It says, When the Comforter is come, whom the Father will send, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of 
of truth. Say that. The spirit of truth. So the comforter is also called the spirit of truth. He's not only called the spirit of truth, he is the spirit of truth. Which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, meaning Jesus. So the Holy Spirit that we experience God through, who is God himself also, will testify of Jesus, prove Jesus, and teach us what Jesus told us in his word. He is the spirit of truth. My, what a blessing. What an awesome God we have. That's further, um, that's, that's further proven if we go back to John 14, 17. That verse says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, not neither knoweth him. The, that's, this is scripture. This is proof. This is fact. So that we know how to think, so we know how to believe, so that we can know and understand our God. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit. It cannot see him. It cannot know him. The world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him. And then forward to John 16, 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, again, proving the spirit of truth, or the comforter is the spirit of truth, they are one and the same. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Praise the Lord. We know, we know and understand as we look through the scriptures the, the, the way that the, the verses and the scriptures and the books are correlated one with the other to prove all is the word of God. Because if we were to turn it back to Deuteronomy 18, where the Lord speaks to Moses and said, I'm going to raise up a prophet like unto you uh, that will speak my word. He will speak the words that I give him. And those who will not receive that word, I will require it of them. That's my paraphrase of that verse. But here we see the spirit of truth is saying that he will not speak of himself, meaning his own words, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. So he heard what the Father spoke through Jesus, and he shows it unto us, and he will show you things to come. Through the Holy Spirit, we understand and know that soon to appear on the scene is the rapture that will, that will catch the church out of this evil world so that God can go in and allow the purging of the earth in the end time and get it ready for Christ to come to set up his kingdom here on earth. This is all given to us to God opening up our understanding through the Holy Spirit's work in our life. For those who reach out for him, those who hunger for his word, those that walk in righteousness and truth. Remember, it, we began this message. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is the church that Jesus is coming for. He's not coming for a church that is wayward that doesn't follow his word. He's coming for the church that loves him. Those that keep his word, 
those that are delighted in him, those that love his truth and do not find it a problem to walk in his glorious truth and power. Now, another mention of the spirit of truth is in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 6. This gives you a comparison. It says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Those who listen to the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, my sheep know me and they know my voice. My voice they will follow. Another voice they will not follow. This is, this is another correlation of that same passage. Those who are of God will hear this message and follow it. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The Lord said, I come to actually put a dividing line, a division, meaning that people will be divided because of what they believe. And this is the proof of who is in the spirit of truth and who is walking in the spirit of error. It's vital and important that we understand the scriptures and not just the ones that appeal to us, but all of the scriptures that give us not only the ones that we love to hear, but the ones that are corrective as well. The ones that are instructive because all, in, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for reproof, for correction, for uh, instruction in the righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So this is all happening to those of you who love the Lord. God is revealing to you his word, and he's not only revealing some of his word, he reveals all of his word. You begin to see more of the scriptures as you believe and walk in his truth. Now let's go to Romans 8 and verse 9. And, and leaving, uh, just, just quoting part of this uh, verse because, well, again, I'm focusing on just what pertains to the Spirit of Christ, or rather, meaning those things that will, that will prove the work of the Christ as revealed in the scriptures. It says, now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So here we see that the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ here. And surely we can understand that, that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. And Jesus is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and Jesus is God. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is God, Father is God, Holy Spirit is God. Each are God, they are inseparable, they work together, yet they can function differently. 
If someone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not in God's kingdom. He is not with God. There's plenty of people out there that don't understand this. A lot of people believe in Jesus, but they never receive him. If you're going to receive him, you get, if you receive him, you receive his spirit. And his spirit abides in you, and you know he abides in you because you witness him. The world can't see him, but you see him. The only way you can see this Christ is to receive Christ as he offers himself to you through prayer and repentance. Praise the Lord. Now let's go to 1 Peter 1.11. It talks about searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of the Christ and of the glory that should reveal. This is speaking, Peter is speaking about an Old Testament passage where those uh, prophets uh, that spoke the word of God, they were searching and seeking what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. So we see that that these, uh, these Old Testament prophets experience the Spirit of Christ. Maybe not as, as we do because of the outpouring of the Spirit of Christ on the day of Pentecost, but the Spirit of Christ, as Christ told the disciples, you, because the disciples had followed him, he said, you know the Spirit of God because he's with you and shall be in you. So we're going to see here uh, proof of that in a moment. The Spirit of God came down as promised by the Father after Jesus had hung on the cross and risen again and went to the Father to put his blood on the mercy seat in the tabernacle in heaven, then the Holy Spirit could be poured out on us today. What a beautiful plan. Let me take you now to Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Again, a portion of it. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say the Lord is what? My helper. The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Why can we say that? Boldly? Is because Christ said that we will he would never leave us nor forsake us. Just like the children of, of Israel in the old time, the Lord was with them, but now he can be in them. The Lord followed them all the way through their 40 years. He was with them all, all of the time of their existence, actually. The Lord is always there. But it's important that you receive him so that he can be your helper, so that you can boldly say, you will not fear what man shall do unto me. Praise the Lord. What that means it doesn't mean that he's going to lighten the load. It means he goes through it with you. It means he, he's your comforter. He's your guide. He's your consolation. He's your joy. He's your peace. The world can't give you those things. 
This is something that abides within. It is something, it is God, the living God. And the only way to receive this is through the acceptance of Jesus Christ through humble, repentant prayer. Praise the Lord. Now let's go to John 16, verse 7. It's going to explain what I was just bringing to your attention. It says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Jesus speaking again. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, look at the center column, the comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. So there Jesus is, is clarifying and teaching us that the reason we have the comfort of the day is because Jesus paid the price, went to heaven with his blood on the mercy seat and sent the comforter from the Father because of his obedience to follow the Lord in it marvelous plan of God to deliver us. Now, we come to the final scripture of this particular uh, point of the message before we go into the next one. It's the next verse, John 16, 8. Speaking of the Comforter, it says, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So this is the work of the Comforter, the work of the Holy Spirit. He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now we may think we know what reprove means in the Word of God, but we want to know what God meant when he wrote it. Amen? So, let's look at it. So, let's look at the word reprove as the work of the com comforter. Again, John 16, 8, and when he, the comforter, is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. That is the first New Testament mention of the word reprove. And as I look, the first Old Testament mention of it, the word, the English word reprove, was in Second Kings nineteen four. I'd like to take you to that now and briefly speak a moment about that so that for our better understanding of the word reprove. Remember, this is a work of the Holy Spirit of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. As we go on in John 16, we find that Jesus said, of sin because they don't believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So we know from that that the world is going to experience the Holy Spirit reproving it of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Let's first look at 1 Kings 19 and verse 4. This is the time of Hezekiah, who is a king of Judea, Judah. 
and he was experiencing, he was, he was a good king. He was blessed of the Lord. The Lord was moving through him, and he was, he had cleaned up Judea. He had cleaned up the, had gotten rid of the idols that the other people were, were worshiping, etc., and etc. And he was following the Lord, and the Lord was prospering him. Eight years, this is in his 14th year, and eight years previously, the king of Assyria came down and overtook Samaria and the children of Israel and carried off the children of Israel and deposited them in various cities around in the Medes and so on and so forth. And so now, at this particular time, eight years later, Hezekiah is experiencing a different king, but the same country of Assyria, attempting to overthrow Judah and him. And so he's very concerned. Um, he had sent his, um, his servant to the prophet Isaiah with the news. And the prophet Isaiah said, sought the Lord and told him, the Lord tells you to not worry about it because this king is not going to take Judah and he's going to return to his land and he's going to die in his own land. And so Hezekiah, being a, a good king, he believed this. But now we've got a different king and this king is coming against Hezekiah and sending for his servants to Hezekiah. And, and uh, making foolish remarks to Hezekiah and to all the children of Judah, Judea, telling them, don't trust in your God because he can't deliver you from us. Our great king of Assyria has taken a lot of countries and nobody stopped him as yet. Don't listen to Hezekiah when he tells you to trust in the Lord. Because, in other words, we're going to sack you, we're going to take you. So don't be concerned about, try, uh, don't try to, to, don't believe that your God is going to deliver you. So this is the background up to this point. And so the king is concerned. Yeah, they, they wrote these things in a letter. And even though that Isaiah said, don't worry about it, of course, they just kept hammering Hezekiah, sent him this letter, and, and he's concerned. So he rents his clothes, covers himself with sackcloth, and he goes into the house of the Lord, and he prays. And so he sends his, his he prays, and he, he tells the Lord, Lord, I need you. Very simple prayer. I need you. And it is true that Assyria has taken all the countries around, and nobody seems to stop them. Now, Lord, I want you to prove that you are God and that there's none like you. And to take care of this situation and deliver us from this evil. So he sends his servants and to, uh, to receive this, this and, and so they, they tell this back again to Isaiah. And in verse 3 it says, And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. In other words, we need help, Lord. This is a serious situation. So here it is that the servants are still speaking. 
And verse 4, and here's for the word of reproof. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, that was a servant of, of uh, Sennacherib, the king, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God. Remember I told you, he was making fun of God. He was making fun of the children of Israel and telling them not to believe God. And will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. So in other words, a recognition that these words that these, that these Assyrians were speaking from the king that was sending these words to Hezekiah, that the Lord heard them. And so they're telling Isaiah, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. In other words, please pray for us to be delivered from this. So they came to Isaiah. So Isaiah said unto them in verse 6, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast of Blast upon them, and he shall hear it. He shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land. And I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Now, for time's sake, I'm going to skip down to verse 32. So you've got the picture. The host of Assyria is camped outside of Judea, threatening to come in and take it. And so the Lord says, look at verse 32. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now let's look what happened. Let's see what the word reprove did on those words. Remember, before I do that, to prove the point here, remember that the word of the Lord says, um, not to be afraid of his words. That was back in, in the first few verses of chapter 19. Don't be afraid of his words. All right. Now in verse 35, it says, It came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So this host that was camped outside of Judea the Lord sent the angel, and 185,000 of them died in their sleep. And when the rest of them rose up, there's all these dead corpses around. So the next verse says, So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. Just like the, the Isaiah prophesied, the way he came, the way he, he's the same way he went back. And look at the last verse. And it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the house of Nishroch, his god, that Adaramelech and Sherezer, his sons, smote him with the sword 
and they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Esther Haddon, his son, reigned in his stead. So what happened there to prove the word, or the result of the word, is that the Lord caused the words that they spoke against Judea and against God and against Hezekiah, that he turned it around upon them and their words became their fate. So we can see from that Old Testament passage a little bit more about the seriousness of what the word reprove means. Now let's look at the New Testament. This is the first mention. This, this word, elenko, is the Greek word for reprove. And Matthew 18, 15 uh, is the next verse. Remember, I told you John 16, 8 was the first mention. Now, Matthew 18, 15 says this. Moreover, if, if thy brother trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. The translation of the word reprove in that passage is tell him his fault. That is the general, the, the, the basic meaning of the word reprove that as, as we know it from the New Testament scriptures. In other words, tell him his fault means expose his sin to him, help him to understand his sin. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing by, through the, the faithful workers of the Lord that are preaching the true gospel, they're reproving the world of sin, telling the world they need to forsake sin and come to Christ. They prove the world of righteousness so that there's no righteousness in this world. The only righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. And he went to the Father to send back his righteousness to us that we could partake of. And reprove the world of judgment to expose and show to the world that there is a judgment to come for those who refuse Jesus Christ, those who mock the Lord, those that hate the Lord, those that don't follow the Lord, those that simply ignore the Lord. So this is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is to expose sin. Jesus did that all the way through his ministry. Do you know that Jesus never, in all of his ministry here on earth, he didn't condemn one single person, but he did point out the sins in their life, the error, and gave them opportunity through his teaching to be delivered. That's what the word reprove means. Let's look at Luke 3, 19. This is speaking about Herod. But Herod the Tetrarch being reproved by him for Herodias' brother Philip's wife for all the evils which Herod had done. When it says being reproved by him, you remember John the Baptist told him, right out in front of everybody. Herod, it's wrong for you to have your brother's wife. Okay, this verse says that he is being reproved. Look what he does in the next verse. He added, yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. So another his word, his response to John's ministry was to go ahead and, and destroy John. So what do we learn from that? Why did the Lord put that in his word to show us? What is the proper response 
that we should have when we are reproved by a person of God or by the Lord himself. Herod didn't do it. Jesus gave the example in the, in the verse before in, in Matthew that you give the brother an opportunity to repent, to change. Repentance means change. Tell your brother his fault. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. Herod says, I'm not listening to that. Who does he think he is? I'm going to put him in prison and kill him. And that's what he did. He added to his denies. To give you a little more understanding of the word reprove. In John chapter 3, verse 20, it says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deed should be reproved should be reproved is the, is the translation of the word reproved. Should be reproved. So a person who is involved in evil doesn't want it exposed, so he doesn't come to the light because the light exposes the sin. John 8 verse 9. It's translated convicted. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience. This is speaking about when Jesus was confronted with these Pharisees blaming this woman that was caught in adultery, wanting to stone her. And you know what Jesus did. He just knelt down and rode in the sand and then finally he said that, that he that is without sin among you cast the first stone. And now the verse. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at, at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Remember what Jesus said to her? He said, where are thine accusers? And she says, they've all gone, Lord. Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So they were convicted. They were reproved by their own conscience. The 46th verse of John 8, is, it's translated convinceth. Which of you convinceth me of sin? For I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Verse 8 of John 16 is translated, he will reprove. We've already gone through that verse. When he is come, meaning the comforter, he will approve the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 24, it's translated, he is convinced. Speaking of the gift of prophecy. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. In other words, they see that you are of God. Because the word you speak is God's word, and it exposes sin, and they are convicted or reproved of their own conscience. In Ephesians 5.11, it's translated reproved. And it says this, and have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That's a bit of instruction that the church needs to hear. 
and to follow. Don't be a part of the unfruitful works of darkness. Don't go with the wicked crowd or the wicked deeds, but rather reprove them, expose them, give them opportunity to make a decision to leave them. Do not be a part of it. Don't walk with the unfruitful works of darkness. Ephesians 5.13, translated that are a reproof. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. Here's a, a, a clarification and a further understanding of the one that we did previously here about coming to the light. The, those that are doing sin, they don't, want, they don't want to come to the light. All right, here. This one says, all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. What is light? What is light is truth. In John 1, chapter 1, it says that Jesus is the light. And Jesus is the word. So the word of God is powerful and it will bring conviction to those who are involved in sin and give them opportunity to repent and be saved. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20, it's translated rebuke. Now this is stronger. This is instruction from the apostle Paul to his his uh, son in the Lord, Timothy. Them that sin rebuke before all. This is, this is speaking of those that sin in the church. This is not speaking about the world sin. Them that sin rebuke them before all that others also may fear. In 2 Timothy 4.2, it's translated reprove. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. Meaning, be always ready to minister the truth. You reprove by exposing the sin, you rebuke the sin in all of its power, and exhort, meaning encourage all of them with long-suffering and endurance and doctrine and with patience. You exhort them to come and follow the Lord. In Titus 1.9, it's convinced, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, as ye have been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers by sound doctrine, by the word of God. You can stop the gainsayers. You can stop them in their tracks. Tim Titus chapter 1, verse 13, it's rebuke. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Again, Speaking about sin in the church, you preach the word to the world to, give, to expose the sin that they might be saved. You rebuke sin in the church sharply that they may be sound in the faith. In Titus 2, verse 15, it's rebuke again. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. This is the instruction of God to the leaders of ministries, those that are involved in ministry. Exhort and rebuke with all authority those that are in the church to follow the Lord. Hebrews 12, 5. This is very important. When thou art rebuked, 
it's translated, when thou art rebuked. Let's look at the verse. And ye, and ye, ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. That's thou art rebuked of him. Uh, when thou art rebuked of him is the translation uh, of the word rebuke in that passage. Excuse me, reprove. So there again, it's pointing out the error and encouraging you to understand what's happening. The Lord is trying to correct you. The Lord wants you to understand that you cannot survive and continue with sin in your life. Let's quickly go to James chapter 2, verse 9. It's in our convinced. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. There, that's reproof. At least the word that is translated reproof. To show us that it's actually the same thing. We're, con we're reproved by the law. We're reproved by the conscience. We're reproved by the Holy Spirit when we have respect of persons and don't treat everybody the same. It says when we do that, we commit sin. Now the last one. It's Revelation 3.19. Very serious and, and a great one to close with. This is Jesus is speaking. This is not only Jesus speaking uh, as the man on earth, the minister on earth, Jesus the Christ. This is the resurrected Christ. This is the one speaking uh, at, that dwells in the midst of the candlesticks, the churches. This is the the um, the high priest, if you will, that is speaking. He says it's the the word reprove here, or ecclesia is, uh, or uh, Anglo is translated I rebuke. The passage says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So what is the correct response when the Lord corrects us? When the Lord reproves us? When the Lord stops us in our, in our tracks? When our Lord takes something away from us? When our Lord causes us to stop and listen, what is the correct response? Somebody say, repent. And repent means not just sorry, but that you hear and understand and you change. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. So these, these definitions and these near words give us an understanding, a better understanding what reprove means. That it's a very serious thing that we need to understand as the Lord showing us you'd better take care of things. You better come up to the plate and be accountable. You better follow the Lord. He says, I will be your comforter. I will be your guide. I will walk in you and you and me. I am your peace. I am your wisdom. I am your understanding. I will show you what Jesus said. I will show you things to come. I am your God. It's with this that I close. And I, I say to every one of you that hear this message, I hope you understand that a message like this that points out the very seriousness 
of a walk with the Lord. And that the walk of the Lord is not a drudgery, but the walk with the Lord is not one of dismay, but the walk of the Lord is a walk of victory that every one of us, because of our, our transgressions and our unrighteousness in ourselves, need that corrective power of the Lord Jesus Christ to not only believe it, but have it operative in our life so that truly our righteousness is the righteousness of Christ, whom God has given through the Holy Spirit to abide in us, that we may have the power to live a holy and righteous life and to be pleasing in the sight. Let's pray. Father, as we close this message, I pray that it shall not be closed to all the people that are listen, listening today, that they may fully understand the grace of God in his rebuke. When you rebuke us, Lord, you're saying you love us. When you chasten us, you say you love us. Why? Because you don't want us to experience the wrath of God. You want us to experience the joy of the Lord and the power of the Lord. And the only way that we can do that is to correlate with you, to fellowship with you. And you're not going to fellowship with darkness because you are holy. So that we must take on the light who is Jesus, who will fill us with light, that we may walk in the light and not stumble in the dark. Oh God, continue to open our eyes. We love you for what you're doing. You're building your church. You're having your way. Your kingdom is coming. Thank you, Father, for your tremendous grace in our lives. Now lay your hands upon everyone that, everyone that hears this message and bless him with the joy of the Lord and the hope that is there through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.